so beautiful. Wait for the PowerPoint get clicked in here. And uh, I come from a family that sings, plays instruments, piano, etc. I can't play the radio without getting in trouble because I have no musical ability whatsoever. But I long for the day that Jesus returns in the heavenly choir I can be a part of. As far as you know, this month's Bible studies that we have for Sabbath school are based upon mission. And mission is vital. A church that doesn't have a mission statement and doesn't know where they're going is like a little boy who shoots the gun in the air and trying to hit the, the barn and misses every time. So a mission statement is vital. And in 2009, the General Conference voted the mission statement for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it has the follows. You can read it. The mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to make disciples of all people, communicating the everlasting gospel in the context, excuse me, of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12, leading them to accept Jesus as personal Savior and unite with his remnant church, discipling them to serve him as Lord and preparing them for a soon return. And now, I don't know whether y'all have a mission statement here, but I would encourage you to, to write one and so that everybody knows what you are about. Now, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was formed and organized and uh, accepted as a church in 1863 as a result of the great disappointment and the Millerite movement that people came together and said, we need organization. So in 1863 was the birth of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, if you will. And then 11 years later, in 1874, J. N. Andrews, John Neville Andrews, which Andrews University up in Barron Springs is named for, was the first missionary sent out by the church. And he was sent to Switzerland, where the mission work around the world began. And so having... Uh, this kind of history behind the mission and the work of the Adventist Church, I would like to have a sermon today about mission. So if we could go to the next slide, and this is what we will do. Uh, I will preach from the Word, share a few scriptures, some ideas, what we've done. Then I will sum up uh, what I've just said and make the appeal and then service will be over. So it's 12 o'clock. Uh, we should be done by two. Okay. <laughs> Let's pray. God and our Savior, we come before you and thank you for what you are. The God who knows all, the God who has all, and the God who wants us. So we pray that your Holy Spirit will use us today and let me, let me have those words to speak that will only uplift you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, next slide. Dum, da, dum, dum, dum. You know what that is? We don't have any TV generation. I guess none of you are older like me. Well, there was a cop show on when I was a kid back in the 50s, 60s, and it was called Dragnet. And so the next slide. Uh, we want to look at Dragnet. Now, I have to go online on 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 record as saying that I hate fishing, and I'll show you why. I hate this kind of fishing for sure because it is yucky. And if you have a computer, what is the one thing you got to have on your computer if you don't have Windows? Or you have anything else? What do you got to have? Virus software. Absolutely. And you also know, and if you don't, and you're looking to get a computer, you know that you have to have that virus software. And even though you got it, you don't want to click anything that you don't know who it's from that is 
Otherwise, even with Kaspersky or with uh, with um, uh, whatever that Microsoft is called Defender, that you still can get a virus and ruin your day. So next slide. So now here's why I hate fishing. Now this picture is a boy with a rod and reel. Well, growing up on the farm, I didn't have a rod and reel. I was lucky to have a cane pole and that would have tied a knot, uh, the string around the top of it and put a hook on the bottom of it. And after a while, we learned to put sinkers on them and uh, what do they call them, bottles, bubbles? Bobbers. Bobbers, thank you. There's a fisher lady. And, uh, and <laughs> uh, she, well, it wasn't gross for me, but but I only went with my brothers, my two older brothers, six years older than I, and five years older than me, because I would get to be with my big brothers out there on the farm and do something together, even though I had to carry the cane poles and the bait while they carried nothing. And they'd get to the pond and would sit there. And I couldn't have a pole, but I'd have to take the fish off the pole if they caught one. And all I could do is just sit there. And I hated, I thought, what in the world is the use in doing this? Okay, next. Well, as I got a little older and the kids out there on the farms around me, that uh, we would get together and we'd go swimming. But sometimes we would take a, and do seining. You know what a seine is? That's where you take a, a net and throw it into the water and make a circle, pull it over, and then you maybe catch some crawdads or some fish, depending on what kind of net, how thick it was. But I hated getting in some of those farm ponds because they were cattle ponds. And in the summertime, the cows would get in the water to cool off. And you can imagine what else would happen. Okay, next. But the fishing I did kind of like is with those same friends of mine out there on the farm, that we would get together and we would go camping. Some people uh, would either, my dad or one of the other kids' dad would take and drive us down to the creek and then we'd get to the creek and then we'd have about a quarter mile to walk to get to the creek because the road would end and that we would use what was called uh, jug fishing. And jug fishing, if you don't know what that is, you take the lid off a jug and you wrap a um, a fishing wire, fishing line on it, put the cap back on so it can't come off. And then you, that wire goes, or that fishing line goes way down and there's a hook on the bottom of it. And then you get a number of those fishing uh, jugs and that you tie them together so they don't float off. And then you take one end tied on this side of the creek, on the other side of the creek, you tie it and so it wouldn't go any place. And then the next morning, you'd go out, you get the jugs, and you'd find fish. Well, one night, we were doing that, and we pulled in the jug, and there was a soft-shell turtle on it. It was the first time I'd ever seen a soft-shell turtle. They're not very thick. You know, they're soft. and But it was kind of unique. I'd always seen the gator turtles and other kind of turtles, box turtles, okay? and But the fishing that I found that I liked was when we lived in Casper, Wyoming. Uh, my father-in-law was a fisherman. He loved fishing all the time. And uh, whenever he get a chance, he was one of those guys that would go fishing even by himself. He liked it so well. Well, when we moved to Casper, Wyoming, uh, the, my in-laws were going to come and visit us after we got all settled into our home. And so my wife wanted to do something nice for her dad. And so the thing that she wanted to do since he liked fishing, he wanted to take her, we wanted to take him fly fishing. He had never been fly fishing. So she went to this outfitters, which was about two miles from our house, and that uh, talked to them about fly fishing and said, yeah, for $500 for the day, take two people fly fishing. She said, well, let me think about it. And that was way too much money even back then. That was big money. And so uh, the next Sabbath, at church, I was mentioning to my head elder, who you have to realize that in Casper and probably the whole state, there's two things that you do. You fish and you hunt. 
And when honey season would come around in my church, the church would be half gone because people would go out for a week to set up camp and they would hunt. They wouldn't come to church. Well, so I knew that this fellow and his wife were, were uh, good at doing things like that. So I asked him about, do you know a place where we can rent the equipment and go fly fishing? He said, why? I told him. And he said, no, you don't want to rent it. I'll take you fly fishing. I'll take your dad. I'll take your sister. I'll take your brother or whatever you want to go. So I said, okay. He said, my wife used to babysit for one of the biggest ranchers in Wyoming. He had 100,000 acres of farm, uh, not farmland, but of land, cattle land, that he would uh, owned. And he had another 100,000 around it that he had uh, leased from the Bureau of Land Management. So he was a big time rancher. And he said, my, my wife used to babysit for this rancher. And so he's given me permission to come on to his land and fish in the Red Fork of the Powder River. And nobody else could go in there. If you did, the law would be called on you, but nobody would that. Now, we felt pretty privileged to being able to do that, that he would let us come in there. Of course, we were close anyway. And so this is a picture of the Red Fork of the Powder River. Now, this is what it looks like when you first get in. He would take us down and drop us off at the beginning. This is not us. But we couldn't, didn't take cameras out there back then. And so they would drop us off. He would go up to a meeting place halfway up the river where we were going to fish. And he would drop off uh, the trailer and the women folk. And then they would take him. Or he would start from there. And he would start fishing north. So with the time we got up to the halfway point, we would get in the car and go up and get him and uh, the friend that was with him. So I liked, I liked it. Cold water. Water never got any further than my waist, and that was only for a short distance. But as we went up the river, the, the, the bank started to close in and get higher until you get and see over the top of the banks. Now, I don't know if you know much, but ever in Casper, Wyoming, when we passed it out there, there was always bear that would come into the city, come into the city. There was always lions, mountain lions, that would come into the city. And they'd have to send the um, Bureau of Land Management people come and sedate them and then take them back up in the mountains and leave them there. So once you get down there and you can't see over these, all you can think about is the, we saw lions at our place where we lived out in the country. We saw bears out there as well. So we know they're around there, even though we lived out there, it was okay. So it got a little antsy for me and we made it through it fine and dandy. And the reason I kind of liked it was because the water was cold and it was crystal clear. You could see the rocks below you. And I caught the biggest fish, let me tell you, of the all of us out there hunting for fish. I caught the biggest one. My father-in-law caught a lot more than I did, but I got the biggest one. And he would never live that down. He's dead now. So I liked that kind of fishing, even though it's wading in water all day long. There's another kind of fishing though that we all should like. And that's why we're here in the church. It's called mission fishing. And the mission of the church is to be fishers of men, fisher of women, fishers of children. That the reason the church exists is to cast out a net. Next scripture. Next. So this morning, I'm going to use a parable that Jesus taught to his disciples when he was here on earth. And it's all about mission. It's about fishing. So if you have your Bibles, say amen. If you don't, say oh me. Hallelujah. So 
going to go to Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to pick it up in verse 47. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Or I'm sorry, I used to, but I switched over to the New King James Bible. New King James, Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 47. And the Bible says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Next. Now, I had the privilege of going with pastors from Illinois Conference back in 2001. And that we went, uh, they took the pastors over there into two groups. And uh, that way, if they put all the pastors on the plane and the plane went down, there wouldn't be a pastor in Illinois Conference. So they divided us in two, just in case, uh, you know, because of the... Uh, well, <laughs> Where's the face? <laughs> well, if, if you remember back in 99, it actually was 99, because I didn't, I debated whether I would go or not uh, because of health. But there was a lot of uh, problems in the Mideast, you know, they, I don't know whether they still have any or not now, but there's always going to be problems over there. But anyways, that they wanted to divide it because, to give you an example, whenever we flew from Chicago over the pole to uh, Germany, that when we got off the plane, wait for the next plane we had to get on. Once we got off the plane, the guards were every place, but they're not like TSA that you have uh, going to O'Hare or over even if you're uh, here in Bloomington. They had their submachine guns. And uh, everywhere you looked, they were, they had their guns and they would take us into a room and that they locked the doors. We were in there. So if there were any terrorists that was going to cause problems, hopefully we would be in a little better shape. And that's the only time I've ever been into an airport where that was the case. Now, sometimes you see a policeman and he's got a sidearm, but you don't see him carrying around their AR-15s or whatever they're called. I'm not a gunman. But anyways, um, when we were there at in Israel, we were spent a, a day and night um, at uh, the Lake Generet, um, the Sea of Galilee, and that um, this boat is a boat that they found in 1984, whenever the drought had lowered the level of the lake, and some guys who were out there fishing saw it. And they, uh, make a long story short, they were able to rescue it. And this is a boat that they, the scientists or whoever does their testing said this was back about 1000 BC E. Now before Christ is dated back to that. So this is a type of boat and it's called the Jesus boat. Uh, and that it was about 27 feet, or it is about 27 feet long, eight feet wide at its girth, and about four feet high. And the inset picture there top left is what the boat would have looked like. Next picture. And the scripture says that, that the Jesus told him that the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea. And this would be the kind of boat that we just saw that the St. Peter, uh, St. Peter, well, that's because the fish that they caught were, was called St. Peter's fish. I'll get that later. But anyway, that Peter and John and James and all those other guys that fished, which all of them basically did, except for Matthew, that this is the type of work that they did. They would sing. And this saying uh, is also we get the word dragnet. And dragnet comes from the Greek word 
Sajin or Sajini, however you would like to pronounce it. Now, um, it means to cast. It means to throw it out and then draw it in. Next, next one. And that the next one is the gathered as sanago, uh, gathered or to bring together. Now, in, in the mind of a Jew, whenever the word the sanago would be used, it would be used under the understanding of gathering in to the synagogue, coming to the synagogue, come to church and worship. And, uh, and now, I don't know whether you know about or not, but the synagogue back in the Jesus time was men and women were allowed to come to synagogue. Now today, uh, the synagogue is basically Jews, men, not women. And I don't know why that changed or where it changed over the years, but it did change. But synago means to gather in, to bring it all in. Okay, next slide. Uh, and so in verse 48, that first of all, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So whenever they would throw the net out and then they would draw it in as they came up to the shore, they would go out so far as the big as the net was and they would then make a sort of semicircle with it and then draw it up at the shoreline and then to pull it in. Now it says that they gathered of every kind. Now, those in the know, and I'm not going to say that I believe it or not, but it's up to you, that they said there was 157 different types of fish in the Sea of Galilee at the time of Jesus Christ. And they use that from John chapter 21, where Jesus, after his resurrection, he went to, well, let's just turn to it. John chapter 21. Um, verse 4. Uh, verse 3. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, and we're going to the tomb. No, that's chapter 20. I ought to be in 21. It might make sense. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And it's interesting that that same trip out there, they had a tourist boat and uh, took all of his pastors on it and went out to see a Galilee. And then they started telling the story about Jesus and catching fish, like they were doing here. And that and they said, okay, now we'll cast our net on this side of the boat. And then they drew it in, and there wasn't no fish. So everybody's laughing. So cast it on the other side of the net. So he cast it on the other side of the boat and pulled it in, and there was fish. So just throwing that in there, you don't have to pay for that, okay? And Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they said, no, and then Jesus said, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, and that's John, if you don't know, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. By the other, but the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153 and although there were so many, the net was not broken. So there are those who believe that this 153 fish that were brought in were tilapia. Tilapia is a fish that's around the world, and it's got scales and fins. It's clean to eat. And 
And the only reason I know all that is because I had a church member uh, family that was from the Philippines and they were talking about eating tilapia when it was going to bite me over for dinner. And I said, I don't don't eat meat. And so, so anyways, tilapia is a worldwide fish. It is also known as St. Peter's fish. And that's because, remember the story about Jesus? I uh, was asked about whom do you serve? Uh, do you pay taxes? Blah, blah, blah. And he said, go catch a fish, Peter. Peter went and brought a fish. And in the mouth of the fish was a cone, coin. And so these are St. Peter fish. Well, anyways, come back to the story here. That whenever they had these 153 fish that they brought in, not all of those would have been fish but eaten. So in the parable that Jesus has given to us here, that in, in chapter 13, and he says, and when the net was full, they drew it to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. Now, what do you think? Do you think they were rotten fish? That's why they threw them away? No. What would they have been? Unclean, bottom feeders, catfish, bineys, other kinds of fish. No, they would not eat, but being good, how to put this, they wouldn't waste any of the fish. They would cast it away, as it says here, but they would sell it to the Gentiles so that they could make some money out of their fishing. So anyways, when it was full, they drew it to shore and they sat down and gathered good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So will it be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire, and they'll be wailing in national teeth. The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. A dragnet is cast out. And I believe that the church is part of the kingdom of heaven. I believe the church is filled with those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. And we are part of that kingdom of heaven, commissioned by Jesus Christ to go forth and to share the gospel. In other words, to cast the dragnet. And we do that through our evangelism, through our Bible studies that we give. One thing about Bible study, when I first went into pastoral ministry, that we were required by Elder Combo to have at least 10 Bible studies a week. That was a criterion to determine whether or not we would be ordained, among other things. But that was the one thing that I always remember and never forget was the importance of Bible studies. And so I worked hard at doing that, and I never failed in having 10 to 15 Bible studies a week as a pastor. So if you ever want to know what a pastor does, just and rather the one day a week, standing up before you and preaching the word, that a Bible student has to teach others about the Bible. The pastor has to be a Bible student. The pastor has to make disciples of his church. The pastor needs to be one that will train the church to cast a dragnet, to give Bible studies yourself. And I would challenge each and every, and I know I've gone from preaching to meddling now, but I would challenge each and every one of you to have at least one Bible study going a week. Just one. You know, whether it's a family member or somebody. You know, we used to take and send out uh, mass mailings of Bible study request cards. I don't know if they still do that or not. But that's a way for every thousand would get about 10. So that's about 1% of the cards sent out. But those 10 would be developed into Bible studies that people would come to church and join the church. And as God is my witness, there was only one church that I ever pastored that we did not have baptisms in one year. The other years that I pastored, we had it. But it was training. It takes time to train people how to cast 
the dragnet, how to cast the net so that they can have a catch and draw people in. Now, let me just say this. You got to love people. Friends don't win enemies to the gospel. That's not going to happen. You got to become a friend first. That's the first axiom. The second axiom is that you have to love the unlovely. Now, there are people that I have had the privilege of baptizing that most people would walk on by them. One illustration. While I was at the seminary, um, I felt, you know, if I was going to be a pastor, there's two things I had to do. One, I had to be a call porter for summer. That's go door to door, knocking mm -hmm. on doors and asking people to buy these books, the bread books, the children's story books and other books and Bibles. And I did that. And the other one that I needed to be given Bible studies, even though I was working 30 hours a week in a seminary and taking a full load of classes at the seminary, that I still needed to have Bible study. And I did. And I went to the pastor at the church that we attended in uh, Fairhaven. Fair, I forget the name of it. It was in Berrien Springs. But it was in Benton Harbor. And Benton Harbor is a very low socioeconomic town. Uh, you've been to Benton Harbor, haven't you? I was from the phone number that said Benton Harbor. And so that that's where I went to do Bible studies. Because I he said, here's the card. And I looked at it, and it was old. So I didn't know whether he tried it and didn't work, or he just didn't do it because of the location. I'm not judging, okay? I'm just saying, I don't know why it was so old. But I said, okay, I'll follow it up. I went there, and the woman had MS, could hardly talk, could hardly walk. The house was typical of... Um, Benton Harbor homes in that area, and that uh, my wife and I got out of the car and walked up the door, and she uh, she came to the door, and when she opened the door, um, I'm going to be polite. You live the best you can live, okay? She was living the best she could live. I make no judgment on that. I don't make that kind of judgment on anybody. She invited us in. The place was filthy. And she invited us to sit down. And we got our Sabbath best on. I'm wearing a suit now. I quit wearing suits when I retired from pastoral ministry. Because this is a formal attire in the Philippines and Mexico and other places. So that's why I wear this. And she invited us to sit down, and so we sat down. We didn't hesitate, even though inside me, I was saying, I don't want to sit down on this. And the one of her sons came running down the steps, and she was had been cooking in the kitchen. And um, I must admit, it did smell good because it was bacon. And if you've ever smelled bacon cooking, you know, I'll tell you what, I, I'm, I'm vegetarian and almost a vegan. But if I had too much temptations to bacon cooking, I'd probably eat it and then I'd repent of it. But no, I wouldn't do that. I'm just funny. But anyways, it smelled so good. And that kind of set me at easy because it brought me back from my childhood, you know, and smelling that. And so she went and said, let me finish this. So she did. And we talked for a while. And I told her what it was there for. And she said, uh, in her way, of speaking back, she said, yes, I would like to take Bible studies. And I said, okay. So I gave her a lesson and I set up a point, but the next Sabbath, the next Sabbath we came. The son came down and he went in the kitchen and he listened. And I noticed as we were leaving that day that at the top of the steps, her other son was sitting there, but he would never come down. To make a long story short, she wound up getting baptized and our sons. If we don't love the unlovely, who will? Jesus loves the unlovely. 
my mom had a saying, don't be ugly. Your mom ever say that to you? Do you know what it means? It means you're not acting very nice. You're being ugly. She wasn't talking about what it looked like. She was talking about my actions. And if I had uh, taken that one look at her and said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong house, uh, goodbye. I would have been ugly. I still am, but I'm ugly. God looks upon the heart. Man looks upon the outward countenance. So we as Christians, part of the kingdom of God, commissioned by Jesus Christ to throw out the net, it is to love the unlovely. It is to love those who are outcast of society. If I were a betting Christian, I'll bet that that lady hadn't had a visitor from anybody for years. I'm probably wrong, but that's what I bet if I was a betting Christian, but I'm not, thank goodness. So God wants us. Those are the two things we have to do. We have to be willing to love the unlovely, and we have to be willing to make friends with somebody before we start telling them what they need to do. And we should never tell anybody what we need to do. Since it's 1230, I'm going to be wrapping this up in just a moment. Because this is all about mission. As our scripture reading was, all power in heaven and earth given to Jesus Christ. And he said, to go be into all the world, preach and teach and baptize, and lo, I'm with you always. Jesus will never ask anybody to go do something that he won't prepare you for. He will give you the Holy Spirit. You ask for it, you believe you're going to get it, and you will get it. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And so when he says, cast out this net, this drag net, and to bring it in, he is bringing it in because there will be souls. The dragnet that sticks out in my mind was the net meeting we had years ago whenever I was pastoring up in the suburb of Chicago and um, North Aurora. Over 110 baptisms out of that net meeting because we did preparatory work for it. The next one that's most important to me was down here in Decatur when I pastored in Decatur. For a year, our goal was to prepare the soil to meet <laughs> Jesus Christ. And what we did every month for a year, we had an entry event to bring people to the church. We started out with one or two that were in the community. And then after that, we started having at the church, a major event. Whenever we finished that year of preparation and had our first night of evangelism at the golf course, they had a big, uh, I still do probably, a, a big theater type of uh, gathering hall. There were 452 people that showed up that night. Not Adventist. The Adventists of the church did things like greet, children's ministries, and the different rooms. But it was non-Adventist, as some would say, pre-Adventist. When they moved over to the church after halfway through, there were still 200 people plus that were coming to the church. God is good. And God says, we do what he commissions us to do. And that is to go and preach and teach and baptize. We preached, we taught, and God brought the people because we cast the net out. So if I could say anything right now, go from preaching to meddling again, 
I'm good at that, my wife says. That whenever you put on there on what you want from the pastor, I would put at the very top, evangelistic oriented. That is going to cast out the dragnet. It's going to teach you, if you already don't know how to get Bible studies, and to be a friend to those who are friendless. To love the unlovely. To reach out. Doesn't matter who they are, because whenever the dragnet was dragged in, it had 153 in one time. Jesus, when he was cooking along the seashore, and in this parable, they drew in the nets and then they divided them. Not everybody that comes into the church from that dragnet that you were set out will be saved. There's some that are coming in to see what it's like to be baptized and then, oh, well, this is not for me. Don't get discouraged when those things like that happen. Keep doing what God wants you to do. There were only eight people that were baptized out of that evangelistic series. I had moved on. Conference said, we got better things for you. I look back on that and I regret, I regret that I didn't see it through, that they brought in another pastor. And nothing, I'm not going to badmouth pastors, but they're humans. We're all human. Some of us have niches in life, things that we like to do, things that we are good at doing by the grace of Jesus Christ, and others who have things they don't want to do. I'm on my soapbox now, okay? Yeah. Now, I, I don't want to sound negative here, but you need an evangelistic pastor. You need a pastor that is willing to go the extra mile to reach people. How many people is in Bloomington? I bet you if I was a better Christian, not counting the college, the university over here, that there, there would be probably 50,000 people, 20,000, 25,000. I don't know. But the point is, people are going to godless graves all around us. And while we don't put the dragnet out, God's coming. And the dragnet will bring in fish that are not any good. They're unclean. But God can make them clean. God can make them clean. And he'll empower you. Last story. When I was in grade school, one room school started out in down southern Illinois. Then it consolidated four schools and I um, was in a four-room school, two grades in the school, in each grade in each room. This is a public school now; it's not a church school. And I would never get up in front of the class and do anything. Teacher would ask, "No, I'm not going to do it." I got in the high school and English class. You had to get up in front and make oral reports. I refused. I wouldn't do it. Why? Because I was scared to death to stand in front of strangers. I was scared to death to stand up with my friends in grade school. Then whenever I got the call December 18th, 1973 at 9.05 p.m. to go and preach the word to become a minister, I thought, yes, I would do that. But how on earth can I do that? Southern Missionary College had to take a required class was speaking. And I thought, man, what on earth am I going to do here? I got to have this class. If I fail it, I'll never get in to. So I stood up and I did my three minute speech and sat down and perspiration just falling all over me because when I get nervous and scared, I just perspire heavily. And I've come, but the point being, if God calls you, he will empower you. 
he empowered me to make it through that speech class, make it through the seminary, delivering sermons at the seminary for grades, and then called me to pastoral ministry when I was told, when I was told by the head of a department, religion department, that I should find a truck driving job. Because I scored out of range of what a good pastor would score. 60 and below, you'd be a good pastor. Anything above 60 on these tests, you're a failure. Go do something else. And that was a recommendation. But then he said, if God has called you to pastoral ministry, if God wants you to preach the word, he will give you the wisdom to preach the word and to do the preaching of a pastor. I never forgot that, even after four years at the seminary without a call to pastoral ministry. Had been interviewed a number of times for for as a pastor. They just shook their head. I didn't give up because I believed in my heart. God had called me to be a minister. And he did, finally, to the Illinois Conference, gave me a shout. I'm saying all that to say in closing that the dragnet has to be cast out and you need to know how to do that. And that's where an evangelistic pastor will teach you how to do those things so that you can be able to bring a growth to this church. So put evangelism on your top of your list. Speaking from a pastor, who was taught evangelism and every church I pastored, we always had baptisms. Even in the smallest churches down in Southern Illinois, we had baptisms. But there was only one year that I never had a baptism and I worked harder the next year. Works don't save you. I said that last time. Works won't save you, but you can't be saved without those works. When you accept Christ, you're Created to do good works. So, friends, I pray for the church here in Bloomington. Not just because I'm going to preach today for the last time, but I pray for every church that I have ever preached in. Every day on my list. Because I want to drag that to bring in the people of this community so this church can be vibrant and growing. I'm not saying you're not vibrant, and I'm not saying you're not growing, so don't misunderstand me. But God wants a church without spot or wrinkle. And the only way you will bring enemies to the truth is by living what Jesus Christ says to live. Christians or to be Christ-like. And believe you me, it's a struggle. But when you ask for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will do its work. So my question to you all is this. What will you do? Will you cast the dragnet out? Will you let Jesus Christ do the separation? Because the end of time is nigh. And we must believe in Jesus Christ and cast the dragnet out. Let us pray. God, our Savior, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for this parable, which is the truth about your church and what you require of your church to do your work to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so whatever happens, may your Holy Spirit continue to work with each individual here in this church and guide the direction that the church must go in choosing a new pastor for this congregation and it'll be your will and not the will of man because we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't have the energy to be a pastor.